but the brother of humble circumstances, poor, glory in his high position, that's positional truth in Christ, he is a believer. Let the rich man glory in his humiliation, because like a flower, flowering grass, he will wither away, he will pass away, and the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and his flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. So what you have is an example here of a couple things that are important for us to grab a hold of. The contrast. There are two contrasts made in here. A contrast between a poor man and a rich man. There's a contrast between the poor man who is a believer and the rich man who is an unbeliever. And what they value in life will affect, very often will affect their eternity. And it's better to be rich in Christ and to be poor in the world than vice versa. That's James' idea. So we're going to talk about that today as we take a look at this. Uh, before we do, I want to thank you for uh, a great uh, February missions offering, probably the greatest in our history. We've never raised $8,000 before. We have four missionaries on the field that we're supporting. We have the Morgans, of course, in the Philippines. Uh, we have the Sextons in Asia. We have the Williams in South America, and we have the Molinars in South Africa. And so uh, what, a, what a wonderful thing is to support these people. Uh, if there's one place that God maximized the dollar, it's on the foreign field, that's for sure. So we, uh, a special thanks to you from the missionaries uh, for that wonderful offering. Um, let, let's open with a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer, priest, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege through your priesthood to confess sin if necessary, and it is necessary. You can't study the Bible in carnality. Spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. And that's important that you understand that because it can only be stu studied and understood through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is important to its application to life. If you're, if you're in carnality, the evidence of it is personal sin in your life that's not been confessed. 1 John 1, 9 says, confess it. God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you because of the work of Christ on the cross on your behalf extended to the believer's life by confession to restore you to the sanctificational ministry of the Holy Spirit under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I give you a moment. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue. Or it could be overt sins. But if you want something out of this hour, you're going to have to be sure that the Holy Spirit teaches you. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. We pray, Father, the same classroom etiquette that is used in the assembly hour will be used with those who uh, are visiting with us uh, by the internet. We pray that they would uh, get themselves in a place within their structure where they can concentrate completely upon uh, this hour of teaching and uh, under the ministry of the Holy Spirit learn the truth of the word of God that will set them free from the cosmic system of false beliefs. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the interesting things, and James is going to do this through his book. You will see him do this thing between the poor and the rich and the attitude of the believer. Uh, you recall that the poverty that these people are going under is not self-inflicted. It is, it is undeserved suffering. They are being enormously persecuted when James write this book, they are, they are deep into persecution where the, the law, the Israelites, this out of Judah and, and uh, Jerusalem and Judea, the, those uh, Jews who were coming over to Christ were being enormously persecuted. They were losing their jobs. 
they were, they were losing their incomes. Uh, they were being persecuted. And by the time right, J James is writing this, uh, th they are being murdered. Uh, simply because they're followers of Christ, not because of any crime they've committed. They are just fo simply followers of Jesus Christ, sharing their faith in the community and with their friends and neighbors. And they are being enormously persecuted. And so a lot of these believers who might have been self-sufficient under the, God's providential grace are no longer there. They've lost their businesses. They've lost their home. They've lost their bank accounts. They've been ostracized. They've been pushed out. And uh, James is right. So we have a whole new, we have in Israel, as James writes this, a whole new class of poor people. a whole new class of poor people, instituted primarily by a government. Uh, you recall how Saul of Tarsus is one of the henchmen for the religious establishment in Israel was out persecuting the church to no end. And so besides having the normal class of poor people, uh, the sick, the blind, the disabled who are for no, maybe no reason of their own, classified poor. Uh, they're begging on every opportunity they can get to just get from one meal to another. But listen, what they're calling poor here, I don't know we even have an understanding of that poor. These are not people who have lost their income and their good sense because of drugs and alcohol and whatever. The majority of these people that we're writing to, that James is writing to and we're studying, uh, is under what's called undeserved suffering. And uh, this is, so there's been a whole, a whole new class of poor. And I want you to keep that in mind as you go through because he's going to talk a, a lot about this. Uh, this is not the idea when Jesus said, the poor you will always have among you. This is a group of people under persecution will go someplace else and establish themselves and their business and their livelihood someplace else if they make it. And they're being driven out. And they're being driven. These believers, the good, the good part of this, and there's always a good part, isn't there? All things work together for good. There's always a good part. The good part is they're going out carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ, what they're being persecuted for. And evangelism is spreading like wildfire. This is that group. And so we've got a contrast on two ideas here that James is talking about. We have, we have the social economical side and we have the spiritual side on the one hand we got a poor people we got a poor guy and we got a rich guy the poor guy I mean he may be poor because he's disabled he may be a beggar he may be that or he could be a poor guy that was once rich and no longer because his stuff has been taken and given to somebody else and so but there has been a new there is the poor versus the rich and the poor man is identified as poor in Christ. He's poor in the world standards, but he's rich in Christ. The rich man is rich in the world standards, but he's, but he's without Christ. So who is really the rich man? The rich man, what the writer is going to say, the rich man is the one who goes to heaven when he dies. He's the rich man. No matter how you're labeled in time, it's how you're labeled in eternity that matters. And so this is what he's after. He calls the poor man a brother, and he doesn't refer that to that person again. Um, he, when he talks about the rich man, he talks about the rich man the same way Jesus did in Luke 16. So it's important to understand the two contrasts we have going on here. We already understand out of Hebrews, the second chapter, verse 11, when it says, for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified, 
in other words, God, for both God who sanctifies and those who are sanctified, believers, are all one from God, for which reason he, Christ, is not ashamed to call them brothers, brethren. I mean, listen, there's a verse that you'll have to let set on you for a while. You think you know what that means, and you don't. That's a verse you're going to have to let set on you for a while. You think you know that, you don't. But I'm going to read it one more time, and then I'm going to push on. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all one from the Father, for which reason he, Christ, is not ashamed to call them brethren. I can't begin to tell you what a high status call to call you a brother, for Jesus to call you his brother, what high esteem that is. And when he calls you that, he's seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven with all authority. Just to give you a hint how important that phrase is. And that's what James is discussing. When I looked at this passage, I broke it down and looked at it as I normally do, looking for clues looking for markers, looking for other ideas within the text on which way I should push the subject. What I found when I looked at verse 9 was a believer who was poor in the world but rich in Christ. In verse 10, I saw an unbeliever rich in the world but poor without Christ. And I got to thinking when I did that about a passage in Matthew 11 in verse 5, Jesus answered in verse 4 and said to them, Go and report to John what you have heard and see. In verse 5, he gives them Isaiah 61, that great messianic passage, where, which he preached in his first sermon in his home synagogue, in Luke 4, 18. He said, the blind receive sight, the lame walk. This is how you identify the Messiah, scripturally. The blind receive sight, this is Isaiah. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the leopards are cleansed, the deaf hear, dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now, the poor can be the poor in the world who, when they put their faith in Christ, are rich. Or it could be the poor in spirit. Those who need the gospel preached to them, the poor who need the gospel preached to them. Now, listen, the gospel is preached to you whether you're poor or rich, right? Right? But here is a messianic saying that the poor must have the gospel preached to them and will through the person of Jesus Christ. He will offer the gospel that whosoever believeth, whether rich or poor, whether male or female, whether Jew or Greek, right? We become one in Christ. That's the power of the new covenant sanctification. So it's kind of interesting James is playing off from this idea of the Messiah, apparently. And so we have that. In verses 10 and 11, he gives a botany illustration. This is really important to James. He gives a botany illustration. And it's a botany illustration of the rich unbeliever. This is what he says. And he does something interesting here. He puts a, a cereal, he puts the heiress tents in a cereal to show you something. He put the, every one of them is an heiress tents. There are four of them. And so I listed them for you to see he's running a sequence. Now, it's just an illustration, but he's running something that is building. So here's what he says. Here's what he says. And this is an interesting, this is a very interesting illustration the way he wrote it, Right? Because this heiress, the series, 
you're showing a building concept. He says, the sun rises. There's the first one, rises. The sun rises. It gets up there where we have the dead heat of the day. The sun rises, and the burning heat withers the grass and flower. And the flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. Here's what he says. So too the rich man. So too the rich man. Look at verse 11. Look in your Bible. Look how he closed that. Here's the illustration, and look how he closed it. So too... The rich man in the midst of his pursuit will fade away. Do you see that? So we know what the illustration is about, don't we? He didn't leave it up for you to guess. He told you. Now, the other thing that's kind of interesting in the way this text is laid out is that the writer also classifies uh, the idea of two verbal connections with the rich man. In the, in the connection of these two things with the rich man, which is he will, he will pass away. That's a future middle indicative. But the middle, listen, it's not a typical middle because it's what we call a deponent verb. See how that verb ended? It ended in an O-M-A-I. That makes a deponent verb. You do not give it uh, a normal uh, look at a middle. It becomes a historical and he will fade away. Notice that's a future passive indicative. And so how you can use the middle is like a passive as far as the illustration. He just used the deponent verb. A deponent verb can be a middle or can be a It could be middle or passive. And it's obviously that everybody's taking it as a passive. He will pass away. He will fade away. See how they did that? Now, that's a future, and this will happen to him. The passive voice, the subject, the, this whole thing will act. So, so too will be the rich man. I mean, his riches, here, you can't take it with you. That's what we say, all right? If all, if all you got when you die is being rich and comfortable, boy, is your life going to change. As soon as you die, your life is really going to change. <laughs> I mean... It's going to be a nightmare for you. Well, that's what Luke 16 taught. So it's just kind of an interesting passage here. The way, the way the writer laid it out is just kind of interesting. Now here's a verse that goes with this rich man who, who has spent his life in pursuit of wealth and has it has wealth and the comforts of life, and when he dies, he will have neither the comforts nor the wealth. And in fact, he has, unless somebody tells him how bad life in hell is, which would be a guy like me, when people say, well, I've lived a hell on earth, well, you don't have to live one in, hell, in, in the next life. And you have no idea what you just said. Need to figure another term other than hell. You may have had it bad, but you haven't had as bad as it is in hell. And so, uh, here's a verse that would be well worth your time to read sometime. Hebrews 9.27. It is appointed unto men once to die and then to judgment. It is appointed. We're all going to die, apart from the rapture. We're all going to die, and we're all going to be judged. If you're in Christ, your judgment has already been taken care of as far as the lake of fire. But without Christ, that's what you have to look forward to in the next life. How bad is that, people? You say, well, you don't scare me. I'm not saying this is scary. I'm telling you the absolute truth. I don't care whether it scares you or not. Let me tell you when to die, it will. You die without Christ, 
You have, you've never been scared as bad as you're going to be. And listen, it's a scare you'll never get over. It will be the most horrifying thing that you could ever possibly imagine, and you will never, ever get any break from it. That's what's bad about it. No break. You know, you can, you can wipe the sweat off your brow and say, boy, I had a bad week. I had a bad thing. I had a bad, bad, bad. But you breathe, you know, you have, you, you have, God puts breath in you the next day to be able to get back up and go at it. Not so in the next life. You need to be serious about this stuff. So I want to talk about three things today in regard to the promise that every, every believer is rich in Christ and therefore will be rich in heaven. You are rich in Christ. That's a promise and that's absolute. And therefore, you will be rich in heaven. I don't care how, what kind of an identity you have in life. This is your identity in Christ. Point. So here's my first point. After studying the, our lesson text, Dr. Randolph Yeager asked an important question. And I think this is well worth addressing. Why should we rejoice over the wealth which we cannot keep and ignore the riches which we cannot lose? Boy, did he make a great statement on this text. In Luke 16, you're familiar with this, but let's go to it because somebody on the Internet isn't. So let's go to the book of Luke, the 16th chapter. In verses 19 through 31, Jesus gives this account. No theologian that I have ever read or know of that's worth their salt in the study of the Word of God has ever believed this was a parable because there are names, places that people would have known. That doesn't make it a parable. This is a story that he gives. This is an account. What I did with this to help you look at it is I broke it down into four points. He does what James did. He contrasts two men's life before death in verses 19 through 21. Let's see, 16, 19. There was a certain rich man. He habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, gaily living in splendor every day. A certain poor man named Lazarus laid at his gate covered with sores, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. We have two men, just like in James. We have two. We have a rich man and a poor man. Then, in verse 22, he contrasts the two men's death. Now, it came about that the poor man died. He was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. This is prior to the resurrection of Christ. And the rich man also died and was buried. Do you see what's missing in the rich man's life that was present in Lazarus' life? Okay, because that's a big deal. Now, one got to go to paradise in Sheol. The other went to the place of torment in Sheol. Apparently, they both died at the same time, or facsimile, and it compares them in their death. Then, in verse 23 through 26, it compares the two men's life after death. The rich man in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. That's the place. And he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. We call that paradise. That's where the believer went before Christ was raised from, his dead, from the dead. He cried out and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. 
Send Lazarus that he may dip the finger, the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Abraham responded, child, remember that during your life, that's a key phrase, during your life on earth, during your life on earth, you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now... He is being comforted here, and you're in agony. Why did two people die at the same time in the same place and go to two different places? Why did one go to Abraham's bosom paradise, and why did the other go to hell, torment? Faith in Christ. That's true for everybody. And besides all this, what's up besides all besides all this what? And besides all this, what's he talking about? What, what, what's he just what's he talking about besides all this? Well, I tell you, he only mentioned, mentioned a little bite, a little bit about what. Besides all this, he hasn't talked about a whole lot of things, has he? There was two guys. They died. One went here. One went there. One says to the other over here, hey, I'm in, I'm in mucho misery. I need some relief. What's he mean? I mean, that's all we got. And besides all this, Between us and you, isn't it interesting that he went plural? There is a great chasm fixed in order that those who wish to come over from there to you may not be able that none may cross from there to us which is an interesting idea. Lazarus would like to help, but he can't. And these are fixed places once you die. They're fixed. When you die in Christ, you go to paradise. When you die without Christ, you go to hell. And those are fixed positions. Those are fixed places in your life. You can, it can never be changed. I don't care if they tell you that you can work, that you can buy your way out, that you can bribe your way out. Listen, it's a done deal. Don't listen to people lie to you. Because the decision on where you go after you die has to be made before you die. It's not made after you die. It's made before you die. That's what he just told you. And there's no changing anything. Don't people lie to you? Don't people lie to you? In verse... 27 through 31, notice the contrast of each person's choice about his type of life after death. And he said, then I beg you, this is the rich man now. Then he said, I beg you, watch this closely now, because you're in the land of the living. If you're hearing my voice, you're in the land of the living. In the land of the living, you better pay attention to what Jesus is going to tell you that's important for you today. Land of the living. He said, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. This is the rich man speaking to Abraham. I beg you, send Lazarus to my father's house. 
For I have five brothers, that, they may, that, they, that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. See, he understands something now that he didn't believe before he died, that hell is real. And if you don't put your faith in Christ now, and you risk dying, you'll go to hell. And you won't get out of it. Now, I didn't make this story up. This is something taught by Jesus. And he says to the Lazarus in hell has a message for those who are living in the land of the living. I have five brothers he may, that he may warn them lest they come to this place of torment. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. They have the word of God that talks about the way to heaven. They have the word of God that explains to them in very clear terms that Jesus Christ came into the world, died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. You've got to make that choice now in the land of the living. If you're on my internet today, you, put, you pay attention to my message. Because if you think there's any way out, there is not apart from Jesus Christ. None. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. You think that's not serious? Listen to the man in hell tell you how serious this message is. He was rich and had every comfort in the world, died without faith in Jesus Christ. And in hell, he has none of it plus discomfort. You're talking about, listen, he didn't call it discomfort. What Lazarus was doing was comfort. You know what he's in? Agony. A pretty strong word. Might I add terrifying agony? because there's going to be no resolution for it in hell. And if he thinks this is bad, wait till he goes through the great white throat judgment and is cast into what is called the lake of fire. This is preliminary. He's not, listen, when you go to hell before the great white throat, listen, that's hell's playground. For the lake of fire. It, in other words, it is worse. He said to him, No, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. They will change their mind about the gospel of Christ. If somebody would go from the dead, somebody will go from the dead, and they won't listen to him either. When resurrection morning is over, the lost are still lost. Because they don't place their faith in the fact that Christ died for their sins. And if they don't take that, then they die in it. And they die in it means going to hell. No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone was raised from the dead, knocked on their door, and said, you remember me? I used to stay right outside your door and ask for pennies. And they got, well, I told you yesterday, I'm going to tell you today, I don't have anything for you. You bum, get out of here. Well, I want to tell you about Jesus. Now, you don't tell me about nothing, poor man. That got to happen. The same people that reject it now, the only time they're not willing to reject is when they're in hell and now they can't accept it. Can't believe anybody wouldn't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. How dumb do you have to be not to do this?
You notice I didn't ask you to join anything, give me anything, do anything. Did you know that? Because, listen, you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The power to save you is in the gospel. That Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. The power is in the gospel. When you believe the gospel, the gospel has the power to save your soul for time and eternity. Whew. God is a gracious, loving God. But he's a terrible, rafting person as well. The last person you want to meet on any day is God as a judge. You want to always meet him as a loving father. In 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, verse 9, Paul wrote, For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty of going to the cross and being buried and being raised. Where did he go when he went, was buried? He went to Sheol. He went to the place where the rich man and Lazarus both went and where the fallen angels of Genesis 6 were. So that you through his poverty might become rich. How come you don't know you're rich? I mean, how many times does the Bible have to tell you that you're rich? I'll tell you why. Because you have a poor man's mentality. You've let the world tell you that a poor man can never be rich. I'm telling you that a poor man can be rich the moment he believes the gospel of Jesus Christ. God calls him a rich man in Christ. Out of the poverty that Christ gave, you become rich. Jesus gave up his riches so that you could have them. When he died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead, that's his poverty. And when you believe it, you get his wealth. It's not material wealth. It's spiritual wealth. If you wanted to meet a real poor man, you should have met Jesus in his first coming. A person who had no place to call his own. Uh, his pillow was a rock. Listen, there's half the preachers. One way to get rid of him is tell him to follow Jesus in his poverty. See how that works. Take away their finances. Take away the pastor's finance and see if he'll still be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not one of them that depend on riches or depend on a salary to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ is worth their salt. Not worth their salt. Not worth salt. Not one of them would... That guy who thinks he has to have a salary to preach the truth of God's word wouldn't have followed Jesus a half a day. He said, leave what you got and come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men, and that's enough. When I was called to the ministry of Jesus Christ, that's what the men preached to us young men. That was the way I was tutored into the ministry. Don't you think time, it's time, Ron, they said to me, don't you think it's time for you, Ron, to follow Jesus and let him take care of you? 
You don't need the world to take care of you to follow Jesus. He didn't say have the world and follow Jesus. That'll make you successful. That's the men I had. That's the men I had on my board that gave me ordination. They held my feet to the fire, by the way. My board just did, wasn't just a nod to God group. They held my feet to the fire. And I'm thankful for it because these men were right. Here's the second point. James is dealing with new covenant believers. Ja James, this is interesting because James has had to make a transition himself from old covenant to new covenant, and that hasn't been easy for James. It wasn't easy for Paul. It won't be easy for you. If you've come out of a legalistic church and have come into this grace church, there's going to be a lot of stuff that will drive you nuts for a while because you're work-oriented and we're word-oriented. You're work-oriented and we're word-oriented. And you're going to always look for a place to serve, 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 serve. And we're saying, sit down, be quiet, and grow up, grow up, grow up. Serve, serve, serve. Grow, grow, grow. People come in, they're hungry for the Word of God. They sit down, and then they want to work, 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 work. And we say, no, no, no. Grow, grow, grow. Work, work, work. Grow, grow, grow. Then they leave. Because they don't want to study the Bible. They just want to do stuff. They don't want to study. You're born to baby. The Word of God is the only way you can grow. Work will never get you there. The Word is the only thing will get you there. When the Word begins to work in your life, your work is normal. It's a normal part of life. It's not the axiom. James is dealing with new covenant believers who are baptized by the Holy Spirit into an eternal position in Christ at the moment of salvation. This is a new day in his theology. This is not how it was done in the old covenant. This is how it's done in the new covenant. This is Norman standard. This is everyday stuff. It's interesting how other translations of James 1.9. For example, one translation says, the brother ought to, the brother in Christ, the brother in Christ ought to take pride in his high position in Christ. The poor in world ideas, the poor in world standards, who is rich in Christ, that poor brother ought to take pride in his high position in Christ because in Christ he has the riches of Christ himself. He was made poverty that you could be made rich. All of you, Paul writes in Galatians 3.27, all of you who were baptized into Christ that's every person who believes the gospel. All of you, all of you, not some of you, all of you who were baptized into Christ, the point of salvation, have clothed. Have clothed yourself. Have clothed yourself with Christ. You know what that is? That's a wardrobe, wardrobe of 20 status privilege you're given at the point of salvation. And you, you know why he says clothed with Christ? Because you have to wear them. Oh, you got two closets in, in your life. You've got the old man closet, and you got the new man closet. The old man closet is who you are, and the new man closet is who Christ is. And that new man closet was given to you. It's the 20 status privileges. It was given to you at the point of salvation. You were given a brand new wardrobe. It's up to you to wear it. Oh, you missed it. All of you have been baptized in Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. You can read that in Romans 6, 3 through 5 if you're interested. In theology, we call that 
baptized into Christ, into Christ, that's positional truth. We call it positional sanctification. That's theology. That's what we call that. When we teach it, when we teach it, we call it positional truth. Rich in Christ means rich in heaven. That's where my title came from. Galatians 3.26, For you are all, not some, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the moment you receive 50 things you can never lose in time and eternity. Whoa. Very interesting. You ought to circle this. Galatians 3, 2 and 3, it tells you that you receive the Holy Spirit's work at the point of salvation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This is a classic of, of what, what in theology we call positional sanctification. When we teach it out, we call it positional truth. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if, first class condition, and it's true, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you're in Christ, how do I get in Christ? Gospel. I, the moment I believe the gospel, I'm baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. We've already established that. We established that in Galatians 3.27. All of you who through faith in Christ Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if that's true, how do I get in Christ? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. How do I get the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be baptized into Christ? Point of salvation. I got to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the power of God to save me. Right? Okay. Here we go. If anyone is in Christ, if that's true, then he is a new creation. That's true. And all things have passed away. And behold, new things have come. See the word pass away? Passed away. See, that's what happened to the rich man while he was still alive. And when he died, he was a rich man. When he was living poor, he was a poor man, but he had the promise of being rich. And he had the riches in him. He had, he had what was called the escrow inheritance accessible to him. But after he died, he had the full inheritance. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, we're all made to drink of one spirit. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. James would add, neither rich nor poor. Equality in Christ is the name of the game. Under the new covenant, equality, equality in Christ. There's no big shots or little shots. There's only Jesus shots. We're all one in Christ. You're not a big deal. I'm not a big deal, but he's the big deal. The rest of us, we're equal in Christ. You ought to be thankful for that. There was a day in America in the church of Jesus Christ we understood this stuff. There was a day in the church when we fought for this stuff. There was a day in the church in the south when we fought for this stuff. There was a day in the south in the church when we were persecuted for fighting for this stuff. I'm not talking about equality in the Constitution. I'm talking about equality in Christ. That day should have never come, and that day should never be. This is what Paul has said. This is what all the writers are in agreement about. 
what it means to be equality in Christ. When we come back the second hour, we're going to take a look at being clothed in Christ. And we're going to take a look at what this means in the status privileges. This is an enormous study for you. Because I promise you, you've got this wardrobe and you don't wear any of those clothes. It's just on for show. And they ought to be, you ought to wear these. They ought to be absolutely, by the time the Lord comes back, this clothes closet ought to be worn out and the others should be like brand new. Not the opposite. Let us pray and we'll take our offering. Father, we're so thankful today for these to come our way. I pray they would stay for the second study. When it talks about the 20 status privileges of what it means to be clothed with Christ. This new wardrobe. It has been given us to absolutely wear out before Christ comes back. I pray for that. I pray for that. I pray for the offering today, Father, that we be wise in every penny that's given to give it, Father, to the cause of Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to go back to a passage, then I want to come to my final point for this morning. I want you to pay attention to this passage in, in Galatians 3.27. All of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Have clothed yourself with Christ. At the point of salvation, you're given 20 status privileges you can never lose in time and eternity. That's that set of clothes. You have been clothed with Christ. Is there more in that wardrobe? Yeah. I just gave 20. If I could get you to wear 20, I'd be a pretty happy guy myself. But listen, you can't wear what you don't know you have. Now, how is it possible that after all these years and as much as I've taught in this, you don't know these 20 status privileges? How come you don't know? Listen, if you don't what's in wardrobe, you're wearing something else. You have a wardrobe, a spiritual wardrobe. You're wearing something. How come you're not wearing that? Listen, there's only two wardrobes. Either it's old man or new man. You're wearing one of them. You've been clothed. So it's what are you going to wear? And so I want you to focus with me today as we discuss these, these 20 status privileges. And I'm going to focus on two of them, but I'm going to identify all of them. Now look, here is 10 status. You're an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador for Christ. With the message of reconciliation, you're an ambassador for Christ. A lot of you wear that, that clothes, and I, and, I, and I thank you for that. You are a beloved in Christ. You are a beloved. A beloved son of God. You're a beloved. You know who you're a beloved of? Of God. And the reason you're a beloved is because the son of God the Lord Jesus Christ, is the beloved of God, and in him you're the beloved of God. It's in Christ that you're the beloved, not in your own efforts and works and identity, but rather your identity in him makes you a beloved. Do you have any idea... <laughs> what that word means? I hear so many Christians complain about not being loved. How is that possible? How is that possible that you have a garment in your wardrobe called the be loved? Because you're, you're wearing the wrong suit of clothes. 
You're looking for the world to give you. You're looking for all, love in all the wrong places. You've got a wardrobe that says you are beloved. How is it possible that you think you're not loved? I'm not worthy of it. Are you kidding me? Listen, you would never, this is a garment that's not required of whether you're worthy or not. The worthiness for you to wear the garment is your worthiness in Christ. You're a brethren. You're a brother in Christ. You're a brethren. You're part of a large family. Your, your father is God. Your big brother is Jesus Christ. You're part of an enormous family. I was talking to somebody the other day. He's just torn up over the fact that he doesn't have a family. They don't do anything. They don't pay any attention to each other. He has a family, but he doesn't have one. And he was bemoaning over the fact that he didn't have one. I thought, well, how's that possible? How is that possible that you are, you've created a, a miserable place to live in your life because you don't have a family? That's not true. Right? You're a brethren. You're a brother in a very active, positive family. How is it possible? Listen, once you know how to be a good family member with God's family, you'll learn how to be a good one to your own. Maybe you don't have to have everybody positive towards you in your earthly family for you to have a positive relationship with them. Maybe you need to go have a positive relationship with them. But you don't know how to do it because you don't have one with the father and the, and the son. You don't wear that you don't wear that clothes. You'd rather wear the old man clothes and sit around and whine and complain and gripe because you don't have a family. How is that possible? You're not wearing the garment that says, I have a family. I'm a brother. I have, I have kin people. I'm an ambassador. I'm a beloved. I'm a brother. I'm a brother. We have the same father. I'm part of a large network. I'm a child of promise. I'm a child of promise. Why would you wear that? You say, well, I'm a child. But listen, do you know you're a child of promise? Do you, do you realize that you're living out the promise of generations before you? And ahead of you, you're a child of promise. You see, I give you scriptures. I gave you a few, and if you got the pamphlet, you can look at more. You're the firstborn. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. You're the firstborn. I hear people complain. Well, you know, I'm the thirdborn. I'm the last born. Everybody goes, yeah, yeah, she's the last born. She's the baby in the family. <laughs> the first born never gets any credit, takes all the heat, has to always be the one that's there to do things for everybody, but nobody does them for me. First born. <laughs> We're all first born. Do you have any idea how important it is? To be part of the firstborn? Do you know who the firstborn is that you take after? Christ. But do you know what he's called? Do you know what identity the firstborn of what? See? Ah, we'll see in a minute. Firstborn of what? Then you're an heir. You're an heir. A joint heir with Christ. Joint heir with Christ. A joint heir with Christ. There are a lot of people you might like to be a joint heir with, but listen, nobody greater than Jesus Christ, a joint heir. 
You know, the world knows what a joint is. They just don't know what the joint air is. We got, we've got some good news for them. The firstborn, the priest, we're a priest. We talk about that a lot. You're a saint. You're a saint. You're not a sinner anymore. You're a saint. Not because of how you live, not because of how you talk, not because of how much money you give into the offering plate, not how well you serve, whether you sing in the choir or whatever. None of that. You're a saint. You're a saint because of Jesus Christ. It's a status given to you. It's a status given to you. You're a saint. Do you know why you are? Because you're holy in Christ. Saint is a person who has the experience of holiness. The experience, in other words, the salvation experience of holiness. You've been set apart unto God. We call it positional sanctification. You're a son of God. A son of God. Do you know how important that title was when Jesus was on earth? That's a big deal. He had two titles, son of man and son of God. And they identified hypostatic union. He was the son of God. He was the son of man. Uh, and it, they're referenced to hypostatic union. They're terms to identify hypostatic union. This is what this represents and this is what this represents in its extreme positive nature. The son of God, the son of man. Listen, we're the son of God. <laughs> we're the son of God. That's a capital S. We're the son of God. Because of the son of God, we're the son of God. Our identity on this earth is with him. And we're the son of light. And that Ephesian passage is really important. You are the son of light. That's with an O, not a U. You are the son of light. Listen, th that's a position, that's a status, that's a status that you hold in Christ, a son of light. And the world needs us. The church needs you. The world needs you. Boy, when you're in total darkness, it don't take much light to know it's light, is it? It's when everything is bright, you turn on the light. It doesn't, the light's just a light. But boy, when it steps into darkness, that's a pretty powerful idea, light. And here are the privileges. Oh, uh, let me show you first. I want to go back to firstborn. Let me show you firstborn because it's kind of unique. And I want to pick out one. In Hebrews 1.6, if you have your Bibles, let's just flash through these. A little quick, and then we'll go home. One six, and and he gets he's into he's the writer here is just he's just knocking out messianic prophecy all over the place, and he comes into verse six and he says, and when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And and it's a reference to the Messiah. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says. He's talking about the firstborn into the world. And then when you, when you look at Romans, let's go back to Romans a moment. Go back over here. I say go back. I'm just talking about going to the book of Romans. Romans 8, 29, you're familiar with this verse. For whom he, uh, he's in that, that part after verse 8. He goes, verse 28, which is famous verse. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of, of his son, that he might be the firstborn, notice that's a capital H, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You see, Christ is the firstborn among many brethren, and we're the brethren. He's the firstborn among the brethren. That's a very famous passage. And then uh, uh, Colossians, I don't know if these are on your paper or not. I have no idea. Did we put them on there, John, or did I add them? Uh, Colossians 1. You want Colossians 1. Here's Ephesians. Here's Philippians. Here's Colossians 1.18. Uh, Colossians 1.18. He is also the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning. 
He is the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. He's the firstborn from the dead. This is the same that is stated in Acts 26, 23, and in Revelation 1, 5. I don't know if they're on your paper or not. Okay? Now, listen to this one. This is, a, this is the biggie. Do you have Hebrews 12 on your paper? Okay. Hebrews 12. I just pulled out one to talk about it. The firstborn. Listen, listen to this. Here's Hebrews 12, 23, 24. Um, verse 22, but, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, to myriads, myriads of uh, angels, to the general assembly in the church of the firstborns, the church of the firstborns who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel to the general assembly and church of the firstborns enrolled in heaven. The firstborn. We're a firstborn. Listen, we're the firstborn in connection with the coming of Christ. We're the firstborn connected with his death, burial, and resurrection, the salvation. We are, we are the firstborn among the dead because of him. In other words, we'll have life after death. That's a powerful idea. Now, privileges. Notice who we are. Part, this is another set of clothes. These are the privileges. We are bond slaves of Christ. Bond slaves of Christ. We have a calling. We have a calling. We are citizens of heaven. We are chosen. We are the chosen of God. We, we have an escrow inheritance because we are an heir. We have an escrow inheritance. We are the living stones in the house of God. We are members of the body of Christ. We are the new creation. We are possessors of eternal life. And we are the righteous ones of God. That's a set of clothes. You don't earn these. You don't deserve them. But they're there for you to wear. Clothe yourself Clothe yourself with Christ. This is what that means. Listen, these are things that you need to pay attention to. This is the Christian way of life. Status privileges is who you are in this world as well as what you are in eternity. Let me share with you the escrow inheritance. The escrow inheritance. Now, you are, are an heir as part of your status, right? An heir. A joint heir with Christ. With, as an heir, you have an inheritance. So here we are in 1 Peter, an escrow inheritance. An escrow inheritance means that something is held in trust for the grantee that is the Christian. An inheritance is held in trust on behalf of the grantee. That, that would be the believer in Christ. Now, in 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4, blessed be, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain. Now, this is why all of that in verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to the great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection from the dead to obtain... In other words, when you believe the gospel, you get an inheritance. It's called an escrow inheritance because you have access to it now. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, it is undefiled, will not fade away, and is reserved in heaven for you. As opposed to something you might have on earth that moth, rust, and thieves could get. Agreed? Listen to that. And listen, the escrow means that this is available for you now. You have, to, you have to show you know it's available and that it's available. And listen, it's always in trust for you. It's always there for you. Listen to how it's described in the human terms of that when he says, imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away and is reserved. 
in heaven for you. And listen, the escrow part of that means that you can, you can write checks on that. You can claim that now. Why? Because you're an heir. And a death has come to give you that. Christ died and is seated at the right hand of God the Father and controls that. You have escrow inheritance. John 10.10, 10, you have the ability to have the abundant life now. Not, in, not, what the, not what the world calls abundant, but rather what God calls abundant. It's a spiritual inheritance. Listen, it's in your clothes closet. You sit around and whine because you don't have it, and you got an escrow inheritance. You don't, don't know anything about it. You don't pay any attention to it. You just let it, let it set in your closet, and you never wear it. You'd rather be the old man, sit over here and whine and cry and complain because I don't have, I don't have this, I don't have that, I don't have this, I don't have that. What are you talking about? Get your, get, your, get your suit out, call the Gresco escrow inheritance, and start wearing it a while. You act like a child of the world, not a child of God. You act like a child without promise rather than a child with promise. Why do you let these clothes set and never be worn? You ought to wear them slap out. I mean, how many times do I have to tell you this? I know, 10. I have to tell you 10 times. I'm going to tell you 10 times because, listen, get those clothes out and wear them. They all are on different occasions in your life. Be aware that you have these. Instead of sitting around and scratching your head and going, ah, 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 pull up clothes out, wear them, and go like, hey, I got it. I got it. da 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 Escrow inheritance. Here's one. He, he, uh, along with that, 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4 goes Colossians 1, 12, and 13. Uh, I don't know if that's on your paper or not. All right. Here's Ephesians. Eph Ephesians 1, 18. You're probably familiar with 1, 18. It's a very popular verse, especially around us. But there's a second phase to that you might not know. You know the first part of it. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Remember that? How about the second half, though? The second half is your clothes closet. What are, what are, and know what the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what, see, now he gets into a whole series of what's, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power to us who believe? See, that's the second part of that. The one is become aware with your spiritual eyes of growth to be able to see what all you have and then bring that spiritual growth into wearing those clothes. And here's my final one for that, I guess. Acts, I don't know if this is on your paper. I don't know. See, John kept John and I had a going thing, and he would say, "Is that is that it?" And I would say, "Yeah." And then all of a sudden, I'd get something going on in my head, and then I'd call him back and say, "No, I've got more." And so I don't know what we finally wound up with in this dialogue because I just kept getting more stuff. So here I am. I'm in Acts. Um, I'm in Acts twenty thirty two. See, you have no idea. How important John Dyer is to your life. But I know how important he is to mine because nobody else will put up with me. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Watch this, Rick. Which is able to build you up. Watch this now. And give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. See, that whole thing is about growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ so that you will get that, pe that garment out of that closet and begin to wear it by, by, by faith. Wear that thing by faith. 
because this is all about grace. It's not about works. It's about grace. That's a powerful passage. And then, uh, and then another one, I'm not going to read it, but you could write it down if it's not there. It could be well there, but I don't know. Hebrews 9.15. We're that, on Tuesday night, we're studying that. These 20 status privilege is one reason why Jaeger, as we opened our study today, asked, why should we rejoice over the wealth which we cannot keep and ignore the riches which we cannot lose? We are the richest people in the world based on who we are in Christ Jesus, and not only in time, but eternity. We are rich not only on the earth today, but we, are, we will be more than wealthy. We will be stinking rich in heaven. Not just stinky. Stinky rich. All right, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us on this subject, rich in heaven. Yeah, we'll be rich in heaven. But oh, we need to be rich on earth as well. We saw it in Joseph. Joseph knew how to work the wardrobe of grace and knowledge and spiritual maturity. And God blessed him so that the world could see it. The, when God blesses people, the world can't understand how they got blessed. <laughs> they can't understand it. I love it. They understand it is, and they understand I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep Joseph near me because that's where the blessings are. And Joseph knew that it wasn't him. He knew it was the Lord. We need to learn that, Father. The world is hungry to see that in the lives of people to know that it's real. How do I know that salvation is by grace through faith and not of it? How do I know that? Well, I know it from the ministry personally inside me. The world knows it by as, as they sit, sit around and reflect on us, just like they did Joseph. The world, everywhere Joseph went, they knew the Lord was with him. We are more equipped to be that person than Joseph ever was equipped. And with the least of his equipment, he became that great testimony. How much more we. Father, encourage our hearts to wear our status privileges. Clothe ourselves with Christ in every, on, on, on and every occasion of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.